Well, a very good morning to you and welcome in joining us on the media channel of the Triple Seven Precinct Ministries. We are so excited to continue to be able to share with you the good news of the Gospel of the Kingdom. And over the past weeks, we've been sharing with you on the principles of how do we build the church in the city. And these are basic principles that you can apply uh, to a building of a church in the city, the corporate body of Christ. But there's also a lot of stuff that you can use in your personal ap application and also in the application to your local household or church that you are a part of. Well, this morning I want to continue with you on the kingdom culture and we've been dealing with doctrine, we've been dealing with fellowship, with koinonia, and then I've also shared over the last two weeks with you on the principles of the table of the Lord or the Eucharist, if you want to call it that. And this morning I want to start with the fourth pillar, which is prayers of the kingdom culture. And this I will do over the next couple of weeks as I want to separate the prayers from the city church, first of all in terms of the pillar, but then later on also in terms of corporate prayer. And lastly, what happens when we start praying from the platform of the city church. And I'm very excited about this, so it is my prayer that you'll journey with me and that you will thoroughly enjoy what I'm sharing with you. We are living in a period of time, or if you want to call it a season, where we see that the Lord now is really beginning to establish the fourth pillar of the kingdom culture, and as I've said to you, that is prayers. There is a current demand upon every household and upon the body of Christ to enter into prayer and to travail in prayer until such time that what God is birthing on the inside of us is coming forth. When we move from personal prayer to the position of corporate prayers as a fourth pillar within the kingdom culture, we need to understand that this is part of a migration process that is taking place in the church, not only locally, but also globally. The fact of the matter is that with every migration that takes place, there is a battle and there is a war that we need to fight. Uh, allow me to just present a scripture to you from the book of Revelations, chapter 12, and I'm going to read to you from verse 1 to verse 6, and I'm reading from the Amplified Version. It says, And a great sign, a wonder, a warning of future events of ominous significance appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and with a crown-like garland, a tiara, of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant, and she cried out in her birth pangs, in the anguish of her delivery. Then another ominous sign and wonder was seen in heaven. Behold, a huge, fiery red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and seven kingly crowns, diadems, upon his heads. His tail swept across the sky and dragged down a third of the stars and flung them to the earth. And the dragon stationed himself in front of the woman who was about to be delivered so that he might devour her child as soon as she brought it forth. And she brought forth a male child, one who is destined to shepherd and rule all the nations with an iron staff, a scepter, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman herself fled into the desert in the wilderness, where she has a retreat prepared for her by God, in which she is to be fed and kept safe for 1,260 days, 42 months, 3 
and one half years. What do we see here? We see migration. We see in this scripture a migration of the woman that is migrating from the heavenlies into the earth. We also see the picture of the dragon that is waiting to devour the child or the man child. Migration is always associated with pain. And for most of us, whenever we need to migrate from one position to another position or areas of our lives, it is always a painful experience. We find several examples in scripture of painful migrations that we can actually study. And I want to just present some of them to you so that you can have a deeper understanding of what this migration is all about. First of all, we can have a look at the well-known story of the prodigal son. We read about the prodigal son in Luke 15 verse 18 to 20 and just allow me to read that to you and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he rose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. We all know the story of the prodigal, of the prodigal son. And we know that he took charge of his inheritance and he left the home of his father. And then he found himself in a place of absolute destitution, poverty, had no food to eat. And then he had to migrate from that place of destitution and he had to migrate back to his father's house. And we see that when he came back to his father's house, the father was ready and willing to embrace him. But he had to go through a painful experience in, term to, in terms of the fact that he had to complete his migration. The second example that I want to show you is that of Abraham. And I want to read it to you from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, verse 1 to 4. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And we all know how Abram had to separate himself and migrate to that place that God has showed him of where he need to move to. It just reminds me there's another message that I preached many years ago on the seven separations of Abram. And if you really want to have a deeper understanding of what and how painful this migration must have been for Abram, I encourage you to get hold of that message and listen to that message on the seven separations of Abram. Another example of migration that need to take place and that we have an example of is that in the New Testament of the impotent man. In John 5 verse 8 and 9, Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. This guy had to migrate from a place of comfort. We was comfortable lying next to the pool of Bethesda. He had to take up his bed after he received his healing and he had to walk 
away from them. We see also the life of Naomi. In Ruth 1 verse 5 to 7, it states, Then both Mahlon and Chilion also died, so the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. Therefore she went out from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law were with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Here we see Naomi had to migrate from the land of Moab and go back where she comes from, from the land of Judah. And that must have also been a painful experience for her, because it was Ruth that followed her, but she had to leave behind everything that she and her husband has built in the time that they've been in the land of Moab. So again we see that migration brings about a lot of pain and suffering. Another example that we find in Scripture is that of the four lepers. We read about them in 2 Kings 7, verse 3 to 5. 2 Kings 7, verse 3 to 5. Now there were four leprous men at the entrance of the gate, and they said to one another, Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, We will enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians, and if they keep us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall only die. And they rose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians, and when they had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. Again here we see that there was pain in the migration. They had to work through this whole process of realizing that there's a possibility that if I migrate from where I am in the entrance gate of the city into the city, I might die. And they had to take a calculated risk in order to shift to that place of entering into the city. Other examples that, that we see in Scripture, and I don't want to labor this point, but I'm going to give you the references and just uh, explain to you the, the process. And please take the time and go and study these scriptures so that you can get the full and the complete story behind all of this. So we can look at the nation of Israel. They also had to migrate. And their migration was also a painful process. First of all, they had to migrate from the land of Egypt. And we read about that in Exodus 12, verse 30 to 43. And we know that God killed all the oldest sons of the Egyptians. And they had to leave Egypt in the night. And they had to journey from Egypt through the Red Sea into the wilderness. And it was with great pain and suffering. Leaving Egypt, leaving everything behind that they possess. Again, there was an in-depth separation that had to take place. But it was choices that needed to be made in order for them to migrate from where they were to where God was taking them. You see, my dear brother and sister, there will come a time in your life when God will place a demand upon you to migrate from where you are to a place of where He is taking you. And it will not be without pain because Migration is part of a dying process. Dying to yourself, dying to what you want and to what you desire, and absolutely embracing that what God has for you. The second aspect of the migration that we see if we look at the nation of Israel is 
that they had to migrate from the wilderness into the promised land. And you can read about that in Joshua 1, verse 2 to 4. It's not such a long portion of scripture, so let me just read it to you. Here we see it says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people to the land which I'm giving to them, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your feet will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. Here God said to them, enter into the promised land. Leave the wilderness. It was a painful process because if you go and study the scriptures, you see that they had to fight to possess the land. They had to overcome the Hittites. The Gegosites, I can't even remember all the Shites, but a, a book that deals with all of these uh, nations that they had to deal with is a book of Dr. Saggy Govender called The Seven Giants. So again, I encourage you to grab hold of this as it will be a great blessing to you as you read and study and meditate upon the contents of that book. Another migration process that we read about in the scriptures in the book of Acts, we read about the lame man in Acts 3 verse 2 to 9 and it says, And a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, and fixing his eyes on him, with John and Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Look at this profound statement that Peter made. It says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. You see, when we study the life of David, we see his migrations as well. First, we see that he was anointed three times. And with every anointing, there came a process of migration. But with that migration, there also came elevation. The first time David was anointed was in Bethlehem. And after his anointing, he had to migrate from the cave of Adullam. We read about it in 1 Samuel 16, verse 13. It says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. You see, this is where David received his call to become a king. But he had to migrate from being that shepherd boy and embracing his call of being a king. Then we see the second anointing that took place, and that what took place at Hebron, the location that was called Hebron. So the second time we see when David was now anointed, it was at this place called Hebron. Second Samuel 2 verse 4 tells us, and the men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. And they told David, the men of Jabesh Gilead buried Saul. This is where David was anointed and empowered to govern God's people. You see, you need to understand this process. First, he was the shepherd boy. 
he received his anointing to become a king. Then the second anointing, we see that the men of Judah, which was only one of the tribes in the nation of Israel, recognized the anointing upon his life. And he was anointed in Hebron where they covenanted with him. Then we look at the third anointing that took place. And that anointing took place in the city of Jerusalem that was also called Zion. And if you read the scripture in 2 Samuel 5 verse 3, it tells us, So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord, and they anointed him king over Israel. This is where David was anointed and empowered to conquer God's enemies. Here we see first in the father's house, then by uh, the, the, the tribe of Judah, and now we see the whole of Israel coming together to anoint him as king over Israel. In 1 John 4 verse 17 it says, In this union and communion with him, love is brought to completion and attains perfection with us, that we may have confidence for the day of judgment with assurance and boldness to face him. Because as he is, so are we in this world. You see, even here in this scripture, we see this, the migration of the believer that needs to take place. As a David company, we need to migrate from the he to the we and not the I. It is not the individual that exactly represents Christ on the earth. I don't care how holy you are. You can never fully represent Christ as an individual. But it is only through the expression of a we company, a company that the fullness of Christ can be expressed. See, we need to understand that this is an anointed company. It is a Davidic company. It speaks of the corporate Christ. If we truly begin to understand this, we will begin to pursue this whole principle and concept of the church in the city as one of the highest priorities in our ministry and in our lives. We will understand that our deliverance and our breakthrough is in the corporate gatherings of the city. When we study the scriptures and we look at the prototypes of the church as it's presented in the lives of the kings, we see an amazing picture appears from scripture. We see a migration of the church from the characteristics of King Saul to that of King David and from there the characteristics of the church as it is demonstrated in the life of King Solomon as symbolic pictures of the corporate church. Let's look at each one of these as you journey with me this morning. Let's first of all start with the prototype that we saw of the corporate church in the life of King Saul. What we see in the life of Saul is that he was charismatic, he was physically very gifted, he was extremely tall and handsome, he was charitable, he was selfless, and Tradition records to us that, he's that he gave many of his fortunes away to the poor people. He specialized in helping pay for the needs of the poor, especially the brides-to-be. When he went to war, he paid the soldiers 
out of his own personal treasury and not from public funds. If we look at the life of Saul, we see that the life of Saul epitomized self-sacrifice. He went to war with the Philistines after he had heard the prophecy that he and his sons will be killed. You know, a lesser person would have ran away, but not Saul. His loyalty and his self-sacrifice for the Jewish people knew no bounds. When we look at this life of Saul, we see a picture of the institutionalized church rise. A charismatic church, beautiful buildings, operating in the gifts of the Spirit. We see a body of believers who are selfless, that's driven towards charity and of taking care of the poor, of the widows and the homeless, the orphans. It is a church that finances missions and that is very active in helping to plant other churches. Sadly, and this is really so sad, it is also this very church that falls in love with herself and with her own beauty. A church that is jealous of other churches as the wife of Christ. It is a church that is influenced by the demands of the people and of the public opinion about the church. If you look at 1 Samuel 15 verse 9, it tells us, Saul and the people spared Agach, Agach, and the best of the sheep, oxen, fatlings, lambs, and all that was good, and would not utterly destroy them, but all that was undesirable or worthless, they destroyed utterly. Saul's second weakness was his insecurity and his jealousy. Even to that point of paranoia, he saw traitors everywhere. David was his trusted aide, his confidante and loyal son-in-law, yet he listened to slander about him, assumed the worst of his motives and made him his blood enemy. No matter how many times David reconciled with him, Saul's insecurity and his paranoia returned and gnawed at him. You guys know, this is such a powerful picture of the tension that we see even in this day in the body of Christ between the Saul community and the David community. Saul could get carried away with moodiness and melancholy. He had many positive qualities, but his weaknesses undid almost all the good that could have been credited to him. And sadly, we say the very same characteristics in the church of today. So let's take a moment and look then at the picture that we see from the life of David. If we study the life of David and the, his character, we see that King David fixed his heart on God alone. So that every choice in the life that he made was passed only through that one filter, and that is, what is God's heart and will? The demand for the David company today is to come to that position that God mentioned to one of the descendants and he said the following in 1 Kings 14 verse 8 and rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you and yet you have not been as my servant David who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart to do only what was right in my eyes. This is the declaration that God made over the life of David. He says, you've not been like my servant David. He kept my commandments. He followed me with all of his heart. 
to do only what was right in my eyes. You know, this to me is such a challenging statement because I have to ask myself constantly, do I qualify? Do I actually meet these standards as one that see myself as being a David, a son of David? The David Company is a body of believers that keeps the commandments of the law. In other words, it is a people that functions and operates from that first pillar of kingdom culture, which is doctrine. In other words, the word of God. Secondly, it is a people who is wholly dedicated and totally and completely sold out to Jesus. And lastly, a people that operate and functions in practical righteousness, or if you want to call it that, demonstrated righteousness. There is really a demand for the church to corporately migrate from the nature and the character of Saul to that of the David company. You know, there was a specific anointing upon the life of David. He was passionate about the building of the temple of the Lord. He prepared everything that was needed for the temple so that Solomon could build the temple. And we also see in the migration, we see this very same thing where we as a church migrate to the wineskin of fathers and sons. Let me just read this scripture to you because I, I wanted to skip it, but I sense the Lord wants me to read it. So let me read it. 2 Samuel 7, verse 18 to 29. So it's about 10, 11 verses. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? Then as if this were a little thing in your eyes, O Lord God, you have spoken also of your servant's house in the far distant future. And this is the law for man, O Lord God. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. Verse 21. Because of your promise and as your own heart dictates, you have done all these astounding things to make your servant know and understand. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for none is like you, nor is there any God beside you according to all you have made our ears to hear. What other one nation on the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem to be a people for himself and to make for himself a name. You have done great and terrible things for yourself and for your land before your people whom you redeemed and delivered by yourself from Egypt, from the nations and from their gods. And you have established for yourself your people Israel to be your people forever. And you, Lord, became their God. Now, O Lord God, Confirm forever the word you have given as to your servant and his house, and do as you have said. And your name and presence shall be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel. The house of your servant David will be made firm before you. For you, o Lord of hosts, God of Israel, have revealed this to your servant. I will build you a house. So your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Therefore now let it please you to bless the house of your servant, that it may continue forever before you, for you, O Lord God, have spoken it, and with your blessing, let this house be blessed forever. 
I want to invite you this morning to come take hands with me in the Spirit. Join me in this prayer that I want to pray according to 2 Samuel 7 verse 18 to 29. I can share with you this morning that God has birthed a passion in my heart to see the church in the city, in the city of Pretoria, in Swami, and wherever I have sons in the earth, that the city church in those cities will be established. Please join me this morning and as I pray this prayer and where I refer to a household, I include everyone that is a believer that is watching this broadcast. Who are we as this household, O oh Lord God, and what this household, Lord, that you have brought us this far? You have called upon us as a house, as a corporate body, and you have mandated us to build you a house in this city, in this city, O oh Lord. We today humbly bow before you as we surrender ourselves to you and to the word that you have spoken to us. Lord Jesus, you know our weaknesses. You know our shortcomings. But as the body of believers, we declare to you this morning our willingness to build you a house in this city. For you know us, O Lord God, you have brought us in our journey to this place, in this time. You have taught us your heart. You have revealed to us your heart. And you will and made us to know and understand your desire for this city and for your temple to be established in this city. Lord Jesus, we declare your greatness this morning, O oh Lord. We declare that there is none like you. We declare that there is no other God besides you. You have established yourself, this your people, to be your people forever. And you, Lord, became our one and only true God. Now, O oh Lord, we pray, confirm forever this word that you've given to us as your servant and this house and do what you have said that you would do in us and through us and establish your corporate temple in this place. Let your name, O oh Lord, and your presence be magnified forever in this house. Let it please you, O Lord, to bless the house of your servants, that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken it. And with your blessing, let this house be blessed forever as we respond in obedience to your call to build a safe city in this city. In Jesus' name, Amen. I want to thank you for joining us this morning. I pray that you will take what I've shared with you this morning. I pray that the Lord will give you discernment as to what is the passion that there is in my heart and that the Spirit of God will rise up on the inside of you and that you will stretch out your hand and you will join hands with us as a household so that together we can build a house for the Lord. 
please make a note that you will join us next week as I will continue then to unpack the migration of David and how it relates to this fourth pillar of the kingdom culture that is called prayers. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful time with your family. And may the Lord bless and keep you. And may He let His face shine upon you and give you great peace in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. See you guys next week.